We had to replace him, yeah, and uh, Jimmy's name came up, so we rehearsed with him for a little bit. But it was quite strange. It must have been even stranger for Jimmy. Jimmy. But you find it difficult to take over the role of Ringo? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> no. As far as Ringo, I can never, um, I can never make up for what Ringo is. You know, how, how I just try. Um, until next Thursday. Next Thursday. Yes. So you're sort of understudy. Yes, I am. Do you think of the great break? Oh yes. Hey, so nice. Treating you good? Enough. <laughs> <laughs>
when you're a rock and roll detective, you're collaborating and you're creating, and it's it's just the more much more pleasant, more fun, and it's what I wanted to do since I was ten. Yeah, <laughs> when you like me, God, uh, I was talking to because uh, Bruce Spies was over in Liverpool yeah. the weekend, um, and I was saying, you know, there's something that we all love is the research, you know, and that buzz. I've been doing a lot of uh, going through the British newspaper archive recently. And you're going through and you're looking for stuff. And when you find it, oh, yes. it's hard to explain to somebody who doesn't get the rabbit holes that we go down. But that thrill is yes. incredible, isn't it? It's really incredible because, you you know, like I always run to my wife and go, oh, look what I found out, you know, about this thing. And she's like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. <laughs> Good. They're you know, understanding, I mean, aren't they? And then I say, how come you don't read my books? And she goes, because you, you tell me six times about everything in the book before you write it. And I said, oh, well, that's true. Good point. Uh, so, at least she's yeah. listening. But it is such a rush when you finally find something uh, and you discover it. And, I mean, you have been so helpful to me over the years um, with leads or information that has really helped me with my research. And, you know, I can't thank you enough. It's, you know, you're right there in the, the middle of the Beatle world right there. So, and it was great to see you uh, when we were there last month. Well, it, it was fabulous. Um, tell us a little bit about, about your trip, because that, that was great to meet okay. up, because obviously with uh, Olivia at Arnold Grove. Right, right. So, well, be the day before that, actually, I, I'm working on a new book idea about this guitar that was found in John Lennon's uh, Mendip's home. It's an electric guitar made in the 50s. And it's British made. It's called a Dallas Tuxedo. And it was one of the first three, three companies that made uh, electric, solid, solid body electric guitars in England. So uh, one of the things I wanted to see was the room where, the, uh, where John Paul and George first played at the Casbah, because that was the day after... John got his first official electric guitar, the Club 40, uh, with the help from Aunt Mimi, you know, dropping the deposit down. And I uh, wanted to kind of get a look at that. And I I don't know, you've probably seen that famous picture where you see um, Cynthia Powell, future Lennon, sitting on the bench, and then there's a girl next to her. Well, I know the girl next to her. She was one of the early cavern girls um her name's val carter I, I don't think that's her maiden name i think that's her name now she ended up marrying one of the swinging blue jeans and they moved to canada but one day i was showing her this picture and asking her questions and uh, about the guitar and did he was he plugged in that night and all that and she said yeah i was there you know and they they were really it was a new thing because Prior to that, they were they were always acoustic guitars. So yeah. said, that was a big big night. So uh, that was a great tour. Uh, Rogue Best Son gives that tour, as you know. Oh, he's, and I, he's great. He's amazing. He's really yeah. up on everything. Very factual, but very interesting storyteller. Yeah, just like Rogue. So then the next uh, thing was we went to Mendips because I wanted to go up in the loft where. Uh, Supposedly, this guitar was found, you know, decades after John left. And Yoko Ono was kind enough to um, grant me permission to go up in there because obviously a dangerous loft is, is not on the normal tour plan for yeah. people because they could get hurt. So uh, it was really interesting to look up there. Very dusty. But one of the <laughs> things that's very interesting about it. It's not an attic like we in the U.S. think of an attic that's almost like a normal room of your house, but up, up by the, the, the uh, roof. But it's, uh, it's got no floorboards. So it just has these one and a half inch joists. And I was looking at how, how could John, you know, let's say Aunt Mimi goes out. Let's say John stole this guitar. He doesn't want Aunt Mimi to know about it. And I thought she goes out for groceries or something. And he has to run to the back uh, thing in the back, you know, that holds all the equipment and whatnot and pull out a ladder. Then he has to go through all these narrow hallways without banging into the walls and up the staircase 
And then he's got to pop open this thing, and he, he has to go up there to retrieve the guitar to, say, play it for 15 minutes, maybe. And he has to crawl along a one-and-a-half-inch joist. I'm just not buying that. No. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get a look at it. And and uh, and then can you imagine having to uh, put the guitar back up there? Crawl so what exactly? You know, my little dog can do that. Like, I've seen her. <laughs> go along these things with four legs, but a, a human can't really do that. But then he has to reverse the process and then quickly put away the ladder. Meanwhile, she has college students renting from her. Wouldn't they say, what's going on? And, you know, hey, yeah. Mimi, what, what's John doing up in the loft? So I don't know. I, I just thought I needed to see that. Like everything, when I investigate, I really want to see the document or see the place or, uh, or view the picture or the video or, or interview the person who knows something just like you do, you know, yeah. we want the actual original research. I don't want to just take anyone's word. I don't want hearsay. You know, he said this to so-and-so who said it to so-and-so who said it. Uh, to me. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, then the next day was Olivia invited us to the blue plaque ceremony, which was really wonderful to honor George and his childhood home. And uh, while I was there, I think chatting to Jonathan Clyde, some guy I didn't know came over and said, hey, Dave, Dave's over there. Go see Dave. <laughs> and there you were. And it was so great because we had been trying to figure out if we could find time to get together. Yeah. So I'm glad that we did uh, get to chat and see you. And I'm glad you got to meet my wife. And Yeah. And and got to be there at the same time as me to enjoy that wonderful experience. Yeah, uh, it, yeah it, it's great to have George honoured because, as in a lot of things, Beatles, he is down the pecking order. Mm -hmm. And it's always tends to be the focus. Is, it's John and Paul, oh, and then it's George and Ringo. But, yeah. you know, as you'll completely appreciate, he was so integral yes. to everything. In there, yeah. right, right near the beginning, you know, from 57, you That's got right. John, Paul and George are together. You know, that was the journey the three of them went on. And he had such great integrity. You know, he he didn't try to gloss over something at a press conference or, you know, here's another interesting aspect. If you look at, uh, what was that Wings Live album? Wings Over America, I think it was called. And then you, you look at George Harrison live in Japan. Well, if you listen to McCartney's Wings album, there's not a single mistake. It was a perfect concert, <laughs> including, the, uh, including the studio overdubs after the concert. <laughs> and then you listen to George's uh, Live in Japan, and you actually see he leaves in mistakes that could have been, you know, digitally corrected and such, because he's honest about it. He he says, this, you know, this is my live show. This is how it sounded. This is us. That's like live music. That's what happens. I know. That's what, what I like. You know, I, I don't think live music needs to be perfected. No, definitely yeah. not. So what, what was George like to work for and to work he was, with? He's great. He's, you know, very humorous. And he um, he's just super nice. He's super funny, you know. And, um, you know, it was unfortunately... Uh, it was a very short time period. It was just a couple of years. However, once he passed away, besides starting to work for Apple, um, Olivia then had me work on many projects for her that related to George, including um, the uh, Living in the Material World documentary oh, yeah. with Scorsese. I was the historical consultant, and that was that was like a three-year project, and it was so much fun. I had just retired from being an attorney. And I was like, oh, this is what I should have been doing since I was 10. <laughs> see, I called you get my to do mom. It. I said, mom, see, it, it happened. It took a while, but I got there. It took a while, but I got there, yeah. It was, okay, it's, a, it's a great film. Oh, it was so cool to work on it. And it was interesting because the, um, the editor, I think his name's David Tedeschi or Tedeschi, he would have me uh, over in New York and he'd say, I want to play all these different clips for you because he says, I know you've seen everything that's been out there, but I want, you know, and Scorsese want, we want really fresh material so that the hardcore fans will appreciate it too. Yeah. So 
it was fun to sit there with them and go, yep, that's really overplayed, but oh, that's new. I haven't seen that before. And and I said, I'll bet that was mismarked in a uh, TV uh, back room somewhere where they stored it, and they and it's that's why no one knew about it. And I said, I'll also bet you it was never aired on TV. And he said, how could you possibly know that? And I said, I'm the rock and roll detective. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, I just figured it out because – I had seen all this stuff. I was, I'm a huge George fan. So I've, and you'd seen it all too. So yeah. when they showed me that clip, I, I thought the only way this clip could surface is if people were going through these cans and all of a sudden they go, Oh, on the inside it's labeled correctly, but on the outside it was in the wrong can. Yeah. And then I also, you know, I've seen all the footage of George that's been broadcast around the world because I've collected it. So yeah. I think that uh, I just figured no one's ever seen this. And so it was a great, it, it's the actual scene. And you'll probably remember this where George is in like a back TV studio area, watching these monitors of the Beatles playing at a very young age. And he's sort of making fun of yeah. I think John with his glasses and he's cracking jokes about it. And, and he was wearing his cracker box palace uh, sweater. <laughs> From that video and that, that's how i was able to they were like can you date this and i'm like yeah he's wearing the cracker box palace uh, sweater They're like holy cow <laughs> so <laughs> it was really it was really fun to work on it because you know i really knew what i was doing and it was just a labor of love and, and that's it isn't it it's you, you do it for the love of it for, you do it for the fun yeah. um, right. and the privilege right speaking of which did you have you already done your um you were talking online about doing a quarry man concert did you already play that or is that coming up yeah no just done that on the on saturday night great great is there any video will we see any online you think um hopefully i'm waiting for it all to be compiled but i mean that was you know for the last 12 months i've been playing with the quarry men and That's on saturday nice. night we played on the original stage in the old quarry bank school where wow. the Quarrymen very first performed. First gig, right? Yeah, yeah. first gig. Wow, that's yeah. fantastic. You know, uh, speaking of that, uh, sort of, and uh, you were talking about honors. I mean, there's no greater honor than playing with a Quarrymen. And so when uh, our daughter, Becca, was getting married, and I think you've probably met her at a couple of Beatle Fests, she was getting married, and um, I said, is it okay if I invite Chaz over for the wedding. She goes, Oh, I definitely want to invite Chaz. So we invite Chaz and he comes all the way over to Madison, Wisconsin. And um, he's there the day before. And I said, Hey, you want to do something? Hang out. And he goes, Yeah, let's let's take a tour of the city. We take a tour of the city. And he's like, Yeah, not much to see here. I said, I know it's not, it's not like Liverpool or Manchester or anything. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's just a university school. And he said, uh, well is there like a really good um, guitar store with that would have good acoustic guitars? I said, yeah. So I take him to that and he walks in and no one knows who he is. And he says, do you have like a really good left-handed Martin acoustic guitar? And they're like, Oh yeah, it's, it's locked up in the back. Oh. So they went and got this guitar and I saw the price tag was like $10,000. Like, Oh wow. So he starts sitting down and he's, he's just, playing some songs, uh, a Beatles song and uh, and one of the uh, Quarrymen songs. And I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing just standing here? So I, I play uh, ukulele. So I said, oh, cool. can, I, can I have one of your best ukuleles? I'm right-handed. And the guy goes, mm, okay. And he hands me this like piece of junk kid's toy that sells <laughs> for $25. And I said, perhaps you didn't hear me. I said, I, I like to, you know, I like to play ones that are made of Hawaiian koa wood. What do you, do you have any good ones? Oh, okay. So he goes and gets me a good one. And we started jamming on the 12 bar blues together, you know, and I was like, I can't believe I'm hanging out jamming with Chaz Newby. This is a wonderful honor and a, such a joyous experience. And he really, he really liked it too. So it was fun. And then we walked out. 
like, here you go, here are your instruments. And then we left, and they had no idea that a, a former Beatle and later Quarry Man uh, had walked into their store. Well, it's funny because um, obviously I, I uh, found Chaz when I was doing Liddypool all those years ago. Yeah. Um, and sort of, he's such such a lovely guy. We, we spent quite a bit of time together. And one of the funny things is when he was coming over uh, for your book launch in St. Yeah. Caucus, um, we said, all right, well, obviously we'll, we'll meet up when we get over there. Mm -hmm. So I arrive, check in the hotel. Um, I've been there the year before, so I go for a quick walk. I go the other side of the Atlantic, and the very first person I bump into in New Jersey was Chaz. Was he taking a walk too? He's taking a walk as well. So yeah. He was the, he was the first person I met, and it was well, him. that's uh, good karma. Very yeah. good karma. What a guy! And because um, obviously, when I was going to be first playing with the Quarrymen, it was going to be on guitar, and then Chaz had his fall. Yeah, um, and so like with three weeks before we juice to open. The, the bandstand at Strawberry Field, uh, Rob mm -hmm. Davis rang me and said, you know, Chaz had a fall, he won't be able to do it. You don't play bass, do you? He said, well, yeah, I can play bass as well. He said, great, go and learn everything on bass. Oh, yeah, so so no no problem here. Relearn everything on bass. I had about three weeks, and I'm opening at Strawberry Field in front of Mike McCartney, the Lord Mayor, you name it, all the dignitaries. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, no pressure at all. No pressure there at all. Wow. And so then, um, I have to do my intro talk. Off. I'm, 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 I'm standing in for Chaz and said, as you know, Chaz played four times with the Beatles, but he was great because he was the first left-handed bass player in the Beatles. And because he didn't have a bass, he borrowed a right-handed bass and he played it upside down. Right. They're like Paul played his guitar upside down for John. Said and so therefore. In my tribute to Chaz, I'm also going to play a right-handed bass guitar, but I'm going to play it the right way up. <laughs> I don't know. He, he never played bass before, and he borrows a right-handed bass and plays it upside down. Amazing. I know. With the Beatles. Yeah. It's what a guy. He, really wonderful guy. Yeah. Uh, he, he basically was the main entertainment at the wedding reception. Oh, I can imagine. He, he was holding court and all these people wanted to talk to him and he just had the best time. Yeah. I uh, did such a lovely guy. And Wonderful. That's guy. what, which will sort of segue us nicely in, into talking about the book is that, you know, what I love doing is obviously what you love doing. Um, and we know John Paul George and Ringo, but it's going out and it's finding these other people who've got an important part in the story, right? Which not many people know about. Of course, one of the most enigmatic people in the whole story was Jimmy Nickel, um, right. which is why when your book came out, you know, and I have told you this privately as well. I'm not just kidding. It is one of my favourite Beatles books because it's exactly what I look for in a Beatles book. Is this right. guy you think? Oh, that Jimmy Nickel. He stood in for Ringo for a couple of weeks. But there was so much more to the story. Right. Um, so and of true. course, I, I've i got my yeah. limited edition signed copy. What what number do you have? I got 33. Pretty good. That's a good number. I, I, would have, I wish you could have added a third. I thought that would be 33 and a third would have been quite nice oh. as well. Well, next time I see you, I'll add that. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> But it's great to so come on. Come let, back and visit you. Too right. So come on. Let's, let's talk about Jimmy and you right. know the, how long did it take you to do all your research and what can you tell us about this great guy who was a Beatle for a couple of weeks? Well, well, what can I tell you? Is read the book. But <laughs> okay, but perfect. Thanks very much for joining me, Jim. Yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, I think that. I was always intrigued uh, by the fact that there was only one sentence in music history about Jimmy Nickel replaced Ringo, who got tonsillitis on, on the eve of the first world tour, and he played with him for a couple weeks. And I thought, well, is that all there is to this guy? And then I started thinking of questions that I wanted, to, wanted answered. Well, how was he in position to be asked even to be the guy to replace Ringo Starr on such short notice. You know, why was it him versus someone else? And then I wanted to know, okay, if he was just an everyday guy, 
like we are, what would it be like to suddenly be an everyday guy and then all of a sudden you're thrust into the world of Beatlemania and you get out, you know, he's, he had a quote that he said, the day before I was in the Beatles, uh, I'd walk down the street and no girl would even look at me. The next day I got out of a limousine with Paul, George, and John, and they were tearing my clothes off and they all wanted a piece of me. And so imagine what that does to your psyche. Uh, and then you have this amaz amazing life. You're on the top of the entertainment world for two weeks. And then all of a sudden, kind of the you know the rug gets pulled out. Ringo returns in Melbourne. You wave. You go to the press conference with five of them, and then you're on your way home. So that 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 alone, you know. And then I thought, well, how come I've never heard anything about him after the Beatles? And I I looked around. I couldn't find much of anything. So I decided to delve into it. And so the first round was in the early 2000s for six years. I started with finding, you know, well, what did he, what did he do first? You know, and then I, I found that he was with Colin Hicks and the Cabin Boys. So then I would locate one of the Cabin Boys and then they would lead me to another Cabin Boy. And then they led me to a, uh, a, a guy that helped him as sort of a roadie drum tech. And so each time I'd finish an interview, I'd say, is there anyone else you think I should talk to or in any of those early years before he was with the Beatles. And so I got to talk to so many interesting people. And one of the pivotal people, when he was in a, he was in one of the big bands at some point after Colin Hicks and the Cabin Boys rock band. Uh, and then he was with Vince Eager and Vince told me all about his time there. And, but, but then he met this guy, Johnny Harris in one of the uh, big bands. And Johnny Harris wanted to be an arranger and ultimately got to be an arranger at um, Pi. And so he brought Jimmy over because one of the first gigs that he got was uh, some Australian guy came in with an idea and said, let's get session players together and let's copy or cover the biggest six hits of the day, whether no matter who the bands are. Well, this was in early 64. And he brought Jimmy over to be the drummer. So amazing that Jimmy got to play on all these tracks. And most of them, most of these top six each week were Beatle tracks. So he was learning Ringo Starr's parts before he ever knew what was going to happen to him in life. So I, I found that a very intriguing uh, deal. And getting to talk to the man who recorded and arranged with Jimmy on those recordings was was quite amazing and they remained friends uh before and after the beatles up to a certain point before he disappeared the first time but it, it intrigued me that um he would do things and he you know starting with the beatles within a year after the beatles he walked out the door on family friends and musicians and many of those people I had interviewed in that first third of his life and career said, we never saw him again. We never heard what happened to him again. So it became difficult. I, I'm not sure at this point how I found out about him getting the Spotniks gig, but some, somehow I found that out. And then I, again, I interviewed the Spotniks. So each time I would, you know, get all the deep inside story on uh, whatever he was doing in the next chapter of his life. So I just kept going with that. And it was interesting when I finally found out that he had married a woman in Mexico named Julia Villasenor, um, I reached out to a rock and roll historian like us, uh, but he's in Mexico and studies Mexican rock history. And he goes, oh yeah, I'm friends with Julia. You want her phone number and email? I'm like, Yes, <laughs> I've been searching yeah, for it for six so. months. So I, why didn't I think of that before? So I called her up, and she doesn't know a lot of English, and she's like, you know, who is this character from the States calling me, and what is he, you know? So she was a little standoffish, and so every now and then I would call, and I, I had to figure out, too, because she'd have to – They they have different times for – eating meals, preparing meals, siestas, all that kind of thing. So I had to figure that out so I didn't, so I could catch her when she wasn't busy. 
Yeah. And I remember finally one day she said, where do you live? You know, we were just chatting. I, I thought, well, we'll just chat socially and maybe eventually she'll trust me enough to tell me about Jimmy. And I said, oh, I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And there's a funny thing about Madison, Wisconsin. When you tell people where you live, they're like, oh, I know so-and-so there, or I know someone who goes to the university there. It, it never fails. So I told her that, and Julia said, oh, my sister-in-law lives in Madison. Okay, what do you want to know about Jimmy Nickel? So once there was that connection of Madison, she started telling me everything about her life, be well, before Jimmy and during and after. One of the interesting things was she went to Sweden and danced in a dance troupe managed by the same manager as the Spotniks. So, uh, but she never got to meet him. But how interesting that they came very close to meeting there. And then after he left the Spotniks, um, you know, suddenly he meets up with her. Someone connected him to her because he wanted to do this sort of tour of Mexico and, you know, capitalizing on Beatle music and other music. So just funny how all these things come together sometimes yeah. and you get yeah. lucky. And so, yeah, so I just found Jimmy fascinating. Uh, I just got a, a note from Ronnie nickel, who is Jimmy's first cousin in, uh, he's in Edinburgh. And, uh, he just said, boy, you really nailed the story. And our family is so proud, you know, to have, have, yeah have you write about Jimmy. We, we always, we all love Jimmy and we all felt that he had a wonderful career and, and you sort of, ca you know, compiled it all into one really great story. And we're so glad that, you know, you've discovered what happened to him. And, and I even then also uh, put some of my interviews with Ronnie into the new updated version of the book because um when I went back to look at those interviews, old interviews with him and other people, I realized this name Josephina kept popping up. And um, my brother said to me, in any mystery, if you can find out something about the mystery woman, she will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he, he was right. So I, I don't want to spoil it, you know, the ending for the readers, but it's very interesting. Uh, all yeah. the little uh clues that came along yeah i mean and it is such a um a great great story and one of the great things that I remember when i was reading it and you were talking about the the top six you know yeah. these records that jimmy had made and i thought because i love collecting vinyl so i went out and i got a copy of this one with jimmy playing yeah you no know, the six Beatles songs and interestingly is that one of the songs that he had covered was love me do that's right and so there are actually now four versions of Love Me Do with four different Beatles drummers. Because you've got That's Pete right. Best, Ringo Starr, Andy White, and Jimmy Nickel. That's right. And what I found most interesting was with... Uh, Read about it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Where you can find out about all 500 Beatles. <laughs> I love this book. It's, it's like... You. Such a great research, uh, you know, <laughs> document for me to use. I love it. Thank you. Um, that was yeah, a the, great, the great thing with uh, with Jimmy's version of "Love Me Do" is the skip beat, which Pete Best gets continually criticised for in the June of '62. Jimmy does that without knowing. Yeah, he never would have heard that demo version the Beatles did in June '62. That's but, right. But Jimmy puts in that skip beat slight different rhythm going into that middle eight section which neither andy white or ringo had done so right. he must have felt the same thing yeah. that the beatles did yeah but then it just needed something in there and jimmy does that and it works it's, it's a great song many people just think it's a very simplistic early beatles song but um there's so many great aspects to that particular piece of music that yeah yeah. Someone could but write a book just about Love Me Do, I think. Uh-oh, <laughs> there's, there's your next homework assignment. <laughs> I've got enough to do, you. Don't give me more. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I know a lot of people will come to me and say, hey, could you do a book about Grand Funk Railroad? And I say, no. <laughs> I have enough to do, and that's not high on the list. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but so, so, so Jimmy's great. So, t- how does Jimmy get the gig? Because he wasn't the first drummer asked, was he? Right, and right. as you say, you know, it's this is crisis moment. Yeah, you know, it's I the world it, tour, and suddenly Ringo's ill. Right. For some reason, the internet, uh, you know, like Wikipedia's and and just journalists who don't really know what they're talking about, they all say, "Oh, uh, George Martin had worked with Jimmy before," and and uh, on this and that and the next thing, and uh, he had, um, you know, he knew Jimmy well and knew he could do the job. And I interviewed George Martin. He goes, "I said, did you know? <laughs> did you know Jimmy Nickel personally? No." Had you ever met Jimmy Nickel? No, this is a lawyer in me, you know, asking every aspect of the question. Yeah. I said, had you ever produced Jimmy Nickel, even accidentally? He said, <laughs> accidentally. No. He said, no, it's impossible because, you know, I was contracted to work at EMI for Parliament. So yeah. he said, I couldn't just go over to Pi and walk in the door and produce Jimmy Nickel there. And uh, and then also, I think that sometimes people confuse. I found actual BBC footage of Jimmy doing a session for um, Tommy Quickly, and yeah. Brian Epstein is in the footage. And I think it was called BBC Panorama or something like that. Yeah. And they were they're kind enough to send me the clips, and that was at Decca. Yeah. And that's yeah. another one where people say George Martin produced that session. Well, he didn't. And it was just really interesting because that's really how Brian Epstein uh, first got a got a look at at Jimmy Nickel and see saw what a great performer he was. Yeah, and you can actually see the two of them, you know, on screen at the same time. And then there's later shot of Brian up in the uh, control room looking through the glass uh, down at Jimmy playing the actual session. And then the other thing was he, you know. Um, Jimmy was was playing live at, at a club and Paul McCartney had hung out there and seen him play there. So, you know, really those two people knew about Jimmy Nickel. And what's interesting is after the first two people turned down the gig to play drums uh, because they had other things going on and couldn't get away, um, it's interesting because then Brian called... George Martin and said, uh, can you get a hold of this guy? You know, this is someone we'd like to like to look at, have him come down to the studio. And before he didn't just like get on the phone to Jimmy Nickel, like he didn't know his number. No. So he called this gal, uh, Lee, uh, Nita, N-I-T-A, Nita Katz. And her husband, Charlie Katz, the two of them were the main two people that would assemble sessions for people. So if you said, I need a violin, I need a guitarist, etc. Oh, well, here's Jimmy Page and here's the so-and-so. So uh, he called Nita and I interviewed her a few years ago when she was 102 years old. And she wow. said, I talked to George Martin and, and he said, do you think Jimmy can do the job in replacing Ringo? And she said, absolutely. He can play all types of of drumming and i'm aware that he's done these uh beetle type sessions with the top six so he's quite familiar with the songs that you're probably going to play on tour and so george ryan says wow that's great and she goes i think he just needs to comb his hair down uh, you know and he'll be fine so i said all right and he got the phone number from nita and then called jimmy and then Jimmy went down to uh, uh, EMI, which it was called at the time, and the rest is history. He passed the audition. He passed the audition, exactly. And of course, George was really opposed to doing the tour, wasn't he? You no, know, this, was, this was a big, big, pivotal moment. Yeah, I mean, he, he was like, if if Ringo's not here, then we're not the Beatles, and we're not, I'm not going. So it was it was difficult. Again, you know, Ringo felt very, or I'm sorry, George felt very loyal to Ringo. And, you know, they were like four brothers. So I, I think he just thought, well, what's the point? You know, we're, we're billed as the Beatles. We're not going out with Ringo. And again, you know, that's George's, you know, great thought process, you know. And, but then, you know, John and Paul and Brian convinced him, hey, you know, 
sometimes careers of pop stars are not real long. And if you have to cancel now, also if they canceled, they would have had to their organization or the Beatles would have had to repay all these promoters who'd have to refund all these tickets. There was no insurance back then for canceling or a sick person on tour. Um, They had all these hotel rooms booked. And I had sat in Melbourne and looked at the um, documents of the promoter there who was communicating for a full year via mail, snail mail with Brian Epstein. So it took a year to put this thing together, almost like a military operation. No computers, no internet, long distance phone calls were too expensive back then. I mean, I... I couldn't even call my grandmother from one state to another because it was too expensive. I had to write her a letter yeah. back then. So um, it was just very interesting. They um, they really couldn't cancel the tour. No. And so I think they explained all these things to George and he went along with it. And one thing I learned, because uh, I interviewed for the, the new version of the book again, I interviewed Don Short, who was a reporter who basically covered the Beatles and the Rolling Stones in the 1960s. And he, uh, he in fact coined the phrase Beatlemania. So I asked him, what was George Harrison like around Jimmy once he had agreed to do it? And he told me while he was, he was on the first leg of this tour with Jimmy and the Beatles. And he said, actually, George went out of his way to be very nice to Jimmy once it was, determined that Jimmy was going to come along and he, you know, he was, he would chat with him on the plane and he was just very friendly and very helpful. And again, I thought there's that great old George Harrison for you. Exactly. Very George. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So then Jimmy's thrown obviously straight in at the deep end and he's got two weeks and it's not like you just go into one place, you know, we're now, now skipping through countries because no, right. who's ever done a world tour before? I don't think anyone. I no. really, I don't know if Frank Sinatra ever did a world tour at that time. I don't think so. I don't think anybody did. So I don't think anybody did. Yeah. All that coordination, you know, you go into to different countries, and you know, it, it must have been difficult then for Jimmy. But as you say, because you provided all the background to his experience, you know, he's one of those drummers because he could, you know, he could read the music, he could be an arranger. And he, right. he could play just about anything. Yeah, exactly. And again, Don Short, this reporter, told me that George Martin sat him down after he was, you know, approved to be the substitute and said, Jimmy, you're going to do great. Uh, I would not have, you know, selected you to come here if I didn't think you could do the job. And I just saw you, you, you did just great on this rehearsal. It's like 20, 30 minute rehearsal. He said, you're going to be fine on this. I just want you to know, you know, you're going to do good. a great job. And I think that made him feel really good because he was a little nervous on the plane, again, according to Don Short. But he said, you know, I'm a little nervous. But he says, you know, that's kind of normal. So, uh, you know, he, he was just going to do it. And he did. He did a wonderful job. I remember Tony Bramwell, when I asked him about, was there any truth to the fact that uh, Jimmy – felt that Brian Epstein later blacklisted him. And he goes, absolutely not. And he said, not only is that not, was that not Brian's style, but Brian and everyone in the Beatles and the Beatles organization were so impressed by Jimmy's friendly, professional, uh, you know, everything he did was so good. They kept it all together until Ringo came back and really saved the tour from a disaster. Yeah, you know, it's funny you talking about this when when Ringo rejoins. It's that wonderful bit of film footage and photos there, and you have got the five of them on there. And yeah. the, is it Ringo makes the first move to pretend to strangle? Jimmy. Strangle him, yeah, right. Yeah. So then Jimmy's reply, and you're just thinking at this moment, what's going through Jimmy's head? He said, "If I just squeeze a little bit tighter, I could be the drummer. I can, I can keep it going." Yeah. You know, another interesting thing, again, you know, all these stars aligned to make that tour possible. And and another really interesting moment like that star alignment moment is 
They're flying to Hong Kong, which is a forever flight in those days. They had to stop two or three times along the way to refuel just to get to Hong Kong. And a lot, you know, as soon as they get on the plane, they find out that Tony Sheridan is in coach and they bring him forward to first class where the Beatles are. And the first person he greets is Jimmy Nickel. And they're like, oh, what about us? We played with you and Humber. <laughs> And they find out that that Jimmy played with Tony Sheridan, you know, as far back as 59 and that they were good friends and that they, you know, mutually respected each other uh, on a musical front. And so it was a really good bonding moment for them because they already knew Tony and then they were getting to know Jimmy. And now they're like, oh, well, he must be good, you know, if he played with Tony. And I, I just think that helped. Uh, socially for them to bond on this long trip all the way yeah. over to Hong Kong. Yeah. But again, you know, who would have expected Tony Sheridan to be on the plane and provide that background? I know. It, it's amazing. Um, and it, it is such a story. And I remember the thing that had the biggest impact on me when I read the book was of seeing that famous photo of Jimmy in the airport, departure oh. lounge. On his own. So he's, and, and there's been so many, again, stories about, you know, did Brian stop his career in Australia? Did he stop it back home? Did he just give him a gold watch and say, clear off? Um, but that photo of, you know, Jimmy's been there in front of hundreds of thousands of fans, been screaming at him for the last two weeks. And then suddenly yeah. there he is, sat in a departure lounge, all on his own. And you know, they say a picture paints a thousand words. That photograph, for me, is one of the iconic photos of the Beatles story, isn't it? It really is. And someone the other day said to me that it reminded them of uh, like a soldier who's been in combat and uh, now and he has PTSD and he's just sitting there going, you know, how do I even go back to regular life after everything I've seen and, and yeah. you know, all the, you know, sadness of being in war but you know this isn't obviously as uh, serious as that but still from a career standpoint he went from being a, a session drummer and in, in nightclub bands and suddenly he's on the top of the entertainment world with the beatles at the height of beatlemania the first ever rock world tour and he's there at the very start of that and and gets to enjoy every aspect of it from playing to press conferences to roaming around cities, having your clothes pulled and all that. Yeah. And, and then he's just suddenly now in this airport going, wow, well, you know, what's going to, what's next, what's going to yeah. happen to me and what have I just been through? And uh, I think it's a, it's just a real moment of sort of a bittersweet moment. And again, you know, that's one of the things that uh, Butch Vig, who's a drummer for Garbage and produced Nirvana's Nevermind album and many other big rock albums, he said, this is a fascinating and mysterious must read for hardcore Beatle fans and anyone who wants to understand the meteoric rise to pop stardom and the subsequent crash landing. That, it, you know, it's the crash landing is the big thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so the thing that's good about the, you know, Jimmy is that, you know, if you call that moment sort of the end of the line or crash landing, he still he picked himself back up. He started his own band uh, for quite a while there. For six months, they had a lot of gigs. They were very popular. They toured a little bit more of Europe as well as uh, they even went to the Cavern Club in yeah. uh, Liverpool. Uh, so they, you know, and he was in the news. Oh, Jimmy bought a fancy sports car, and all these <laughs> Jaguar, I think it was. Um, and then that didn't work out, you know, because basically the gigs got smaller as the newspaper headlines started to disappear. Yeah. And he had hired session guys and he had to pay them what they would have made on sessions, which was a lot of money. And so it just became a financial problem. So they all went back to work. And then he picked himself up and started the sound of Jimmy Nickel in early 65. But by summer, he was bankrupt, divorced, out of work, out of money. Paul McCartney reached out to him 
helped him out. He, he connected him with Peter and Gordon on some session work and some yeah. shows. And, uh, but he, it's interesting because he never went back to session work. You know, I think that he mm. was so changed by that experience thinking, well, I can compete with the Beatles. I can be in a big band yeah. too. But yeah. he didn't go yeah. back. And again, this Nita Katz said to me, the 102 year old woman, she said, you know, we set up Jimmy Page for success and we were trying to do the same thing with, uh, with Jimmy Nickel and he just didn't come back and we were trying to build a career for him. Like, like we tried to create a great reputation for Jimmy Page. And I said, you know, speaking of that, Nita, do you think that if Jimmy Page, Jimmy Nickel and Jimmy Page had ended up playing together on sessions, that he might have been in Led Zeppelin. And she said, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I never thought of that. <laughs> I said, I don't know, I just popped into my head. So, you know, it's just we all make decisions in life. There's always yeah. a, a fork in the road, and hopefully we, we hope that we take the right one. But Jimmy always never gave up. You know, the, after that point in time, he got offered the job in uh, with the Spotniks. And what I later found out was, when he was touring with the Shub Dubs in, in the fall of 64, they actually went and, and were on the same bill as the Spotniks. And so they got together socially. I'm sure they observed him playing. So when their drummer was told by his wife he couldn't tour anymore, uh, they decided, let's try to hire Jimmy. So each time, if something didn't work out, he would vanish and then show up somewhere else and start all over again. And I, I admired the fact that the the last page of the book is not him sitting sadly in the airport. It, you know, it's, he always was doing things that he wanted to do his own way. He was very yeah. independent and, and he should be very proud of the, the career he had because um, it was multifaceted and covered a number of years. Yeah. And as you're saying, you know, he was that talented who could do musical arrangements and stuff, yeah. you know, he wasn't just a guy who could sit there and, and bang the drums. You know, he's right. a very, very talented, skillful drummer who played right. with some of the biggest names. Yeah. And it's always sad when people think, oh, Jimmy Nickel, he played for two weeks with yeah. the Beatles and think, don't just consign him to that. And, right. and that, again, is what I loved about the book is that because all the research you'd done, you could follow his career and you think, yeah, he did he a lot. On top of his game. Yeah. In fact, um, your viewers might want to know, I created a um, Spotify playlist of Jimmy recordings so you don't have to go out and, and visit lots of record stores looking for 45s. But I think it's called The Beatle Who Vanished, Jimmy Nickel, or Jimmy Nickel, The Beatle Who Vanished. But that's the name of the, the playlist on Spotify. And you can listen to quite a few songs through his career uh, that I was able to find on Spotify there. And it's pretty enjoyable. Yeah, and I'd say he, he was a, a great thing, but it's, it, it's that enigmatic thing with it, with his story of he's there and then he just vanishes, then he pops up. So it's like he did um, at the, the Beatle Festival in, in Holland, what was that, about 84 ish, whatever it was, and yeah, 84. Sits, sits in with the band and then mentions that he's going to write his, his story. Oh, but yeah. It's really interesting that what ha what was really nice was the uh, coordinators of that fest had a private sit down with him and t and tape recorded an interview with him and that's when he came up with this you know I'm planning to write my own book and then he got into a bit of an argument with his son uh, at that time and he was talking about all these these different plans and they were kind enough to let me you know review that tape so that I could put all that in the book and. I think he really enjoyed that festival and I, I really don't understand why something happened where he suddenly he told his son to tell people I'm dead so that they wouldn't bother him. And, you know, I'm sure that uh, Mark Lapidos and the Fest for Beetle fans would have loved to have had oh. Jimmy Nickel come to Absolutely. the festival. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've only, I think we've only had two Beatles at the fest, uh, Chaz Newby and Pete Best. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we need we need more Beatles at the. Yeah, fest. <laughs> I'm going to find some more for you. <laughs> oh, Ringo, I have nothing to do. They should come to the fest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
And Jimmy Nickel. And Jimmy Nickel. And, and of course, now with, with the uh, the latest updated version of the book, yeah. it's the thing that everybody wants to know. Because and I've been asked it so many times. You know what happened to Jimmy Nickel? And I, obviously, I, I tell up to go, to go and get your book. But we just right. didn't know because he makes this occasional appearance. Yeah, uh, like he's had to look in the British newspaper. Where he's, mm -hmm. Was it painting and decorating or, or something? He, he like it, he's there. Right. Yeah, doing construction. And, and then he's gone again. Remodeling, and then he's gone again. And then, and his son um, Howie made an appearance on behalf of Jimmy in Bloker. And uh, they were, they, I, I write about this in the book, but basically in the 90s, Bloker honored the Beatles for playing there on that tour with Jimmy Nickel. Only they have Ringo on the monument. And I um, go into great details to, you know, what happened. And they realize, oh, geez, we should have had Jimmy Nickel on there. So Ringo's little head moved away. And now there's a picture. And you could tell on the monument, this change because Jimmy Nichols doesn't look like the background doesn't look the same as the other, <laughs> but they, they remodeled the monument and uh, how he was there to, you know, pull the curtain off and uh, celebrate that. Well, during the press conference they had with him there, he said, I, and that was like 2014. He said, I haven't seen or heard from my dad in over 10 years. So, I mean, that's really something. And, and uh, the Ronnie Nickel, his cousin, they were born one month apart. They were best friends, not just first cousins. And he said, yeah, I haven't heard from him since about 2008. So it was just really something that he, not only did he not want to go to festivals for Beatle yeah. fans, he, he really wanted to disappear. Uh, and, and so I, that's why when I, find out information about him in this update. I, I don't put everything in the book because I don't, you know, I don't want him to be stalked or bothered no. or what. No. But it is a, it's, it was quite another, it actually it was another 10 years to discover what happened to him and to find out all these other sorts of things. Uh, like people write you, and you probably know this too, people write you uh, some, uh, letters about something in your books after they come out. And in my case, people, you know, would say, uh, oh, you you um, you got this wrong or you got this right or whatever. And and some woman wrote to me and said, you know, I had this very long affair with Jimmy Nickel. It started right after he got back from the Beatles. I was a dancer at this particular show on the same bill as Jimmy. And and, you know, we, that's where we met and fell in love. And we were hanging out backstage and kind of canoodling and. I, you know, I asked the Shub Dubs, was there some girl canoodling with Jimmy Nickel backstage at this show? And they're like, no, there was no girl backstage. Did that they never And then she says, I, I went with him to Sweden and toured with him with the Spotniks. And I'm like, wow. So I, I then contacted Jimmy's Spotnik roommate on two years of tours. They were always roommates together. Peter Winsness, the keyboard player. And I said, what was it like having uh, three people in the room with you on tour, this woman? And he goes, there was no woman on tour with us. And, and then she said, oh, we, he came back from Sweden at this particular time and, and proposed to me. We got engaged. Well, at that particular time, they were on a like 67 date tour and they took one week off to do some recording back in in uh, this one town in Sweden and then went right back on this tour. So he didn't have time to go get engaged. So it's funny that sometimes people want to insert themselves oh. in history and you probably know it too. You have to corroborate it and either yeah. discount it or agree with it based on, you have to do more research to figure out is this true or not. Yeah. Cause it's amazing how many rabbit holes you can go down when you have, this little bit of hearsay and someone tells you yeah. quite sincerely and honestly, oh no, I did this. Yeah. Say, and you, cause you have to just accept it and then go and yeah. try and verify and corroborate it. You think, okay, how do I go back tactfully and say, there's absolutely no way. Um, right, I know there's, that. Been, there's been a number of books from people who are like on the fringe of mm -hmm. the Beatles story who've elevated 
you know, their part in the story. Their role, and, yeah. It's, it's pretty, yeah. They, you know, and if you were to research a lot of their claims, they probably wouldn't necessarily come true. Exactly. Yeah. Which gives us something to do. Yes, it does. Keeps us out of uh, nasty gangs. <laughs> Keeps us in mischief. <laughs> yes, we're we're um, we're pretty much stuck with the computer and interviewing people, and yeah. But that's a good thing, you know. Keeps us out of trouble. Yeah, it does. So tell everybody where they can uh, they can get your book. Okay. Well, um, first of all, the book is called the new version is called The Beetle Who Vanished. 60th Beatles anniversary tour and it's available at Amazon in three formats ebook Kindle hardcover and paperback and it's in every Amazon in every country around the world that has Amazon so no matter where you live you can find it if you live in America and you want an autographed copy you can go to the Beatle who vanished.com uh, it's it's really too expensive. Shipping usually exceeds the cost of the book if I have to send it out of the country. I know. You know that, yeah. It's tough. I just had to buy it. <laughs> yeah, so it anyway. It. It well, that's right. It. You had to buy the hardcover and get it shipped over, right, from the Beale uh, Fest. Yeah. Well, yeah, so those are the two places. And you can find out more information about the book at thebeetlewhovanished.com, and there's a place to... Um, if you give you put a put up your email address, we send you a free excerpt of the book as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Jim, thank you so so much. Keep detecting, keep rocking and rolling. You too. And keep thank and keep so writing. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to chat with you and an honor to be on your program. I oh, appreciate thank you. it. And I know we'll be in touch. Definitely. For, I will see you again detecting. soon. All right. Take care, Jim. Thank you so Thank much. Bye-bye.